Wonderful, it would be my absolute pleasure. Good afternoon, Superintendent Himmel and the members of the school board. My name is Jessica Price, and I'm the coordinator of the International Baccalaureate, or IB, program at Lakanto High. It is my honor to be here to talk to you today and to share and celebrate in our successes. The IB program at Lakanto High began in 2008 with our first class of pre-IB freshmen. The program was initiated by previous IB coordinator, you may know him, Mr. Derek Bittner, <laughs> with support from Superintendent Himmel and members of the school board. We have now completed 10 cycles of graduating IB diploma program seniors, and thanks to the overwhelming support from the district, Mr. Kuhn, and Lakanto High School administration, we have seen great success. Oh, I'm so sorry. So you may be asking, what is the IB? In essence, the goals of the IB can be simplified into two areas of importance, good teaching practices and high expectations for students and staff. Regarding our good teaching practices, the IB highlights five approaches to teaching and learning that identify powerful outcomes. The IB asks that teachers create a classroom learning environment that develops student skills in collaboration, thinking, research, communication, and time management. Students are urged to work together to solve problems, communicate effectively in their native and second languages, examine the knowledge they build, and expand upon it through research, and become well-balanced, organized students. The IB also holds its students and teachers to high expectations with the IB Learner Profile. This profile asks that the students be knowledgeable about academics, be risk takers, principled, balanced, inquisitive thinkers, reflective, communicative, open-minded to new learning, and caring about their local and school communities. These learner profile traits, in conjunction with the five approaches to teaching and learning, aim to develop our students into well-rounded, lifelong learners who are successful in academics as well as in their future career fields. The IB program at Lakanto High currently offers two possible tracks, the IB Diploma Program and IB for All. The IB Diploma Program is one of the most rigorous high school tracks available for students, and the rewards definitely justify the rigor. To earn an IB Diploma, students complete four years of rigorous and engaging coursework, including various honors, AP, and IB courses. Throughout these courses, students take meaningful assessments that measure their learning in various ways. To earn the IB Diploma, students also participate in the unique Creativity, Activity, and Service, affectionately known as CAS, pushing them to take risks, try new things, and serve their local communities through volunteer work. Outside of their coursework, students engage in an extended essay process, choosing a unique topic and developing a research question, resulting in a 4,000 word research paper, similar to a graduate dissertation. Students also immerse themselves in epistemological discussions and explorations in the required diploma course, IB Theory of Knowledge. Students present this epistemological exploration yearly at our TOK exhibition, which a few of you attended last year. We hope to see you again this year on March 2nd to see our students shine again. Over the past 10 years of graduating IB Diploma classes, the success of our program has been consistent. Excuse me. In this time, an average of 70% of Lakanto High students in the, in the program have earned the IB Diploma. Through this success, students collectively earn, on average, over 1,000 college credits a year. Acceptance to major Florida universities for our students ranges between 75 and 95 percent, often nearly doubling national acceptance rates to schools like UF and FSU. Finally, by earning the IB Diploma, students collectively earn, on average, over $390,000 extra dollars a year in Bright Futures rewards alone. It goes without saying that we are very proud of our students and the success that they've had and our teachers for guiding them there. Here you can see some of the CAS endeavors that our students have engaged in, including the Student Organized Beat the Traffic 5K, which has raised over $10,000 in three years to fight human trafficking in Florida. Our students also pursue involvement in athletics and fine arts, support local charities, and even participate in bone marrow donor registration and blood donation. These are just a few of the ways our students give back to their community. The second track offered by Lakanto High IB is our IB for All initiative, making IB courses available to our entire school population. 
Starting in 2019, all juniors and seniors are enrolled in IB Language and Literature as their ELA courses. This includes our Access and ESE students, who I have personally witnessed flourishing in these classes with appropriate support and differentiation. We completed our first round of IB for All examinations last year, and we are happy to report that students exceeded our expectations, with over 55% passing the exam, earning 198 additional college credits for our non-diploma track students. This surpassed our, our goals by 15%, and we can't wait to see these numbers grow with this year's seniors. So what's next for Lucanto IB? Continuing to build upon the effort to increase, increase the number of current zoned LHS students involved in IB, Lucanto High School is considering offering the IB Career Related Program. This program was designed by IB as a way to give students planning, students planning for a career-related post-secondary path to have an opportunity to take rigorous academic courses within a vocational context. Prior to COVID, Mr. Bittner, the IB coordinator at the time, and Mr. Kuhn realized that the students taking CTE classes deserve to have access to these rigorous courses as well. To offer this program, LHS does not need any additional classes, does not need any additional teachers, and does not need any extra funding from the district. Rather, LHS will be utilizing current courses and infrastructure to simply give students and parents more opportunities should they desire them. Superintendent Himmel, members of the board, I thank you again for the honor of sharing with you my passion and my excitement for our program today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. And I will share the presentation with all the board members when I return to my computer. Miss <laughs> um, Press, a couple quick questions. One, who was your English teacher in high school? <laughs> At Crystal River High School. <laughs> so my 10th grade English teacher in Crystal River High School was Miss Counts. <laughs> so that, that was actually a tease. That wasn't my real question, but that was just a tease. Um, but, she, but she wasn't on the swim team. <laughs> well, no one can be perfect. Um, um, but Miss Price, the, the, the career path um, this opportunity is, is wonderful. Um, you may know the answer to this. I know if you don't, Mr. Bittner may be able to, but um, do you happen to know what program right now probably uh, currently has the most successful uh, industry certifications that they've earned year over year? That I do not know. This Mr. is I'm still undergoing some rigorous okay. training Bittner. on the career program. <laughs> you, usually it's been IB um, that has done that through a lot of the, the courses having to do with Microsoft certifications and others. And I see Mr. Kuhn shaking his head because that, it, and, and I say that because it really fits in with what you're you're looking to do, and so it's exciting to me to have that. Thank you. Um, and Miss uh, Miss Powers, I have to always, you know, you are known as the godmother of of IB, and uh, thank you for both bringing this forward and also for your continual support. Thank you so much. And then I'll add one thing too, because you know I love teaching my ones and twos. I like teaching you honor pre AP kids, but but I love my ones and twos, and, and I I agree with you when you challenge them. They will meet your expectations every time, and I'm so happy to hear that they're in those classes. Yes, ma'am. I had the pleasure of, of sitting in on a class with our Access students in our IB Language and Literature last year, and the excitement they had for the coursework and the, the way that it was so easily adapted to their needs was really just a great day to be in a classroom. Thank you, Thank you, Ms. Cross. Thank you so Appreciate much. It. Thank you. And last week, I visited one of the IB classes, one of the IB classes, and it was in history. And the teacher was so good, the course, <laughs> and he went over everything from the very beginning of time to the present day. And by doing that, it made me rush home and grab two history books, and now I have them on my desk. Yes, and I have another one that I've read. I will tell you that in Ms. Ms. Power's visit, um, her and I both learned a lot about roly polies in the pre-IB biology lab, and we learned a lot about American history. We were very surprised how much we didn't know yet. <laughs> and it's so much fun learning, too. So. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I mean, something I've always back, and I know you being an IB teacher, you continually back 
I know Mr. Bitten backs too, so when they know. And the teachers in general, they see the success with IB and the method that IB uses. It's not just one that can just be an IB. It can be in every single class, in every single school, in every single level, because the method is an educational method. So. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So Thank much. you so much for your support. Thank you again. And if we could stand for a moment of silence. downtown. Um, I want to share a story with you and if I could have convinced Rory today to come speak and not dance while she was sit talking, but she probably would get gun shy. I wanted to share what went on throughout the district. I know many of our classrooms and teachers um, shared lessons about 9-11 and yesterday I had the pleasure of going downtown to the 9-11 display which Andy does every single year. And it's such a heartfelt thing to go through when he's talking about it because a lot of his colleagues died that day. But I wanted to share an exciting story with you. Friday, I picked Rory up from school, and that evening she shared with Dennis and I 9-11 events. She talked about the Twin Towers um, falling down. She talked about the bad guy being on a plane and all the good guys jumped in and the plane crashed and nobody survived. I tell you that story because I know sometimes we get criticized if people don't think we teach Americanism, history, and all those other um, topics. And I just tell you it is well and alive in Citrus County. You all know that. She's a first grader. And to hear that come from our first graders certainly gave um, me a thrill, but also gave us goosebumps while she was telling the story. So um, I appreciate everything and all your support, but i just like to share those stories with you so that when you hear um, the naysayers out there who really don't have a clue what's going on in the system, we've got real stories to share with them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. <coughs> okay, we need a motion to adopt the agenda. I move to adopt the agenda. Second. We have a motion on Ms. Powers, a second by Ms. Counts. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Citizens' comments. Do we have any citizens that need to make comments? Not. Oh. Reserve comment. Requesting approval on the agenda. Oh. Okay. I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Mr. Dodd, a second by Mr. Kennedy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. And now, Ms. Adele, recognition of donations. <laughs> Approve the $500 donation to Hernando Elementary School from Janice Jane Hampton. Approve the $500 donation to Homer Sassa Elementary School from Dr. Aria Orris. Approve the $500 donation to Humanist Primary School from Janice Jane Hampton. Approve the $500 donation to Pleasant Grove Elementary from James J. Hampton. 
approved the $1,000 grant to Prince River Middle School from the Florida Retired Educators Foundation. Approved the $1,000 donation to Prince River Middle School from the William and Donna Fletcher Trust. Approved the $500 donation to Eminence Middle School from Janice J. Hampton. Approved the donation of staff shirts valued at $1,305 and one cent to Citrus High School from an anonymous donor. <coughs> approved $500 donation to Citrus High School from Janice J. Hampton. Approved the $500 donation to Citrus High School from A. Abel Septic Services. Approved the $500 grant to Citrus High School from Light South Community Foundation. Approved the $1,990 donation to Citrus High School from Citrus Fusion Volleyball Club. Approved the donation of math mani manipulatives for the elementary schools in Crest, valued at $2,682.92 from the Rotary Club of Central Citrus. Approved the $556 donation to Crest from Crystal River Auxiliary 4272. Approved the $500 donation to Crest from Rotary <coughs> Club of Crystal River Foundation. Approved the donations totaling $8,482 from the Kiwanis Club of Inverness to Citrus High School, Central Ridge Elementary, Crest, Crystal River High, Crystal River Middle, Crystal River Primary, Citrus Springs Elementary, Cit Citrus Springs Middle, Rural City Elementary, Forest Ridge Elementary, Fernando Elementary, Mercedes Elementary, Inverness Primary, the Canto High School, the Canto Primary, Pleasant Grove Elementary, and Rock Country Elementary. Approved the $95,000 grant to the Academy of Environmental Science from the Felburn Foundation. Approved the $3,212.62 mini grant to WTC from Mid Florida Regional Manufacturers Association. Approved the $1,500 donation to WTC from John and Judith Bernard. Approved the $5,000 donation to WTC from the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation. Approved the $2,000 donation to WTC from the First Presbyterian Church Men's Fellowship. Approved the $1,500 donation to WTC from the New Covenant United Methodist Church. Approved the $2,840.86 donation to WTC from All One Family Incorporated. Approved the $500 donation to WTC from Dollars for Scholars. Uh, that is a total of $133,071.41. Thank you, Mr. Dow. And our kids are blessed with a wonderful <coughs> community that cares about them. Yes, yes, they are. All right, Mr. Bidner, presentation. We're actually going to add to that donation. All right. <laughs> Um, but we wanted to have, give an opportunity to the two of the gentlemen of the family who are going to be donating $100,000 to the Canton High School. Uh, recently, the Davis family, longtime residents of Citrus County who resided in the Canton, donated $100,000 to establish the John Murray Davis and Alma B. Davis Memorial Scholarship. This scholarship shall be in the amount of $2,000 and awarded annually to one student graduating from Lacanto High School who attends to major, who intends to major in agriculture or an agriculture related field. This scholarship will serve students for many years to come and we would like to give an opportunity for Dan and Gary Davis to talk about it and after they're done we're going to present the check with Ms. Chat. Superintendent Hemmel and uh, Principal Kuhn, members of the board, we are very pleased to be here this evening to uh, to make this donation. I am Dan Davis. This is my brother Gary Davis and his wife Martha in the back. We are representative of the Davis family, the entire Davis family, which really is quite large. Uh, but we really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to present or to represent the estate of our late Uncle John F. Davis and the entire Davis family. It's with great pleasure that we carry out his wishes and the directives of his will and his trust um, in making this donation. It was his intention to uh, honor his parents and our grandparents um, that would be ongoing you know, for many years to come, the memorial to them. 
And uh, so this is the way that he decided to do this. As you know, this scholarship is being provided solely for graduates of Lacanto High School, where our family lived for many, many years, with an emphasis on those students uh, seeking to further their education at the post-secondary level in the field of agriculture. Our grandfather, uh, John Murray Davis, was born in Lacanto in 1899. He met and married his wife, Alma Boatwright Davis, at the former fairgrounds in Lacanto, right across from where the cemetery is in Lacanto, about 1922. Together they raised five children in Lacanto, our father, William Murray Davis, Louise Davis Wilson, Walter Dwayne Wade Davis, Betty Davis Williams, and our other uncle John Franklin Davis. The Davis family originally moved to the Lacanto area from South Carolina in the 1850s. The Davis family plot at Magnolia Cemetery in Lacanto now holds the remains of six generations of our family in the same plot. Uh, my brother Gary is going to tell you just a little bit more. During their lifetime together, our grandparents lived in a house at the corner of Highway 44 and 491, just across the road from the Church of Christ in Lacanto. Their house sat about where the gas pumps are, if you're familiar with that area. And we played in that yard and in the woods around there in the cemetery and everything else as we were growing up. At that location, John Murray Davis served for over 30 years as Lacanto postmaster maintained a general store for many years and farmed numerous parcels of land excuse me, in the Lacanto area. It was also at that location in the 1930s that our grandfather, along with our father, Bill Davis, built the first school bus for, for Lacanto children to attend school in Crystal River. The bus was the previous Marita bread truck and was converted to a school bus by adding windows and they actually cut the windows in this old metal school bus with an army knife and a hammer because <laughs> they didn't have the saws and stuff to do it so they did what they had to do. They also ad uh, added canvas roll down flaps to cover the windows when it was rain or cold um, and they built the wooden seats for that bus. My dad and our grandfather built those wooden seats and I actually still have one of those wooden seats. <laughs> it's pretty special. Um, our grandfather and, and our dad, um, Bill Davis, drove the bus transporting the students until regular school buses were obtained by the district. <clears throat> Papa and Grandma Davis and Uncle John and the rest of the Davis family believed in education and believed in providing opportunities for young people to see, succeed in life and, and in their education. It now gives us great pleasure to present a check from the John F. Davis Family Trust in the amount of $100,000 to the Citrus County Educational Foundation to be invested and used for recipients of the John Murray and Alma B. Davis Memorial Scholarship for Lacanto High School students. On behalf of the Citrus County School District, we thank you so much for your generosity. And Gary, I have a story for you. Um, this weekend, because of your generosity, I cheered for Tennessee. <laughs> and I will tell you, it about killed me, but we won. Okay? So I'll keep cheering, and we appreciate your generosity. <laughs> I do want to say one more thing, uh, listening to the IB presentation, I'm a retired educator myself and, and worked for many years as a career and technical education teacher and administrator, retired as the director of Marion Technical College in Ocala. 
and uh, it is so exciting to hear about IB and career and technical education blending together. That is, uh, you're here. I've not seen that anywhere else, so congratulations on doing that. Thank, Thank you. you. And I will, I will tell you, I look at the uh, FH speeches and, and judge them every once in a while, and the year before last, a young man stood up in an elementary school and provided a business plan that most adults couldn't do to run a successful farm. I, 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 gave, I gave him points in every category. Awesome. It was eloquent and he was just touting agriculture. Very good. <laughs> and, and sir, as you go out, um, Mr. Dixon's right there. He is a graduate of UT. <laughs> and uh, he, he bleeds orange big. <laughs> so, go volunteer. Yes. Thank you. And thank you all. We look forward to, to being here to present that first check for the scholarship. Thank Bless you very you. much. Thank Bless you all. Thank you. Miss Wayne, I think you're going to get up here. <laughs> I'll you patiently are. wait always. When they're handing out that kind of money. I know. I'll <laughs> patiently wait. <laughs> I ask the board to approve the instructional support recommendations as listed on the goldenrod. You've been a little busy. We have been very busy. <laughs> I, I looked at it. It was so thick, but we've got the out of field teachers. Yes, How we have out of field. Can we can do we do a mandatory ESOL training and just lock them in the room until they finish? I it? wish we could. <laughs> I wish we could. It wasn't that hard. It was not. That Is hard. it still modules like yes. the old days? Yes, they do. They yes, they do modules. And if you're a language arts teacher, which I was and Miss Counts was, we did the most. Yes, you did. And yeah. we we did it years ago. And Miss Swain, I had heard that one of our staff members was being a mentor to a former veteran who's now going into the classroom at one of our schools. Is that maybe one, do you recall, if that's part of the new program? Or does that just happen to be, it's that just they're a veteran I that we're supporting? I think it's just happening, correct. So you just support everybody. We do. Seriously, thank you for doing that, and thank you for that veteran for stepping forward too. Yeah. In our out of field, we have a we have the list. That we always like to bring it early, and then we will have another one at the end of September to catch anyone that we have started late or we've missed. And how many openings do we have? We have right now, Brendan. I want to say about thirty-three. Okay, I, bet, close, I think we have twenty-nine close. the last year. Yeah, okay, right, but right we're around there. Some of them around. Correct. Yeah. I'll make a motion that we approve the personnel and support. Recommendations on the Golden Rod? Second. A motion by Ms. Counts and a second by Mr. Kennedy. Do we have any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Item B I ask the board to approve the school and district administrator pay increases. I, I pulled these only because I pulled all of them. And normally they would have gone into consent because it's all been happened and stuff like that. So I pulled all of these because I would like our teachers and our support people and our Teamsters to understand that these negotiations have been going on since March and now they're done. And Ms. Wilson is probably feverishly trying to check everything so that they can start to get their checks. But I just wanted to know, and George, George is gone. The Chronicle beat me a little bit because they put it in the paper today. Yeah, they did. Um, and so, um, just have to congratulate Mr. Balmer and Mr. Bishop on, on their intense negotiations this year to get it all done to our Great. staff and our personnel. But um, they just need to know that almost 90% of our general fund, I think, goes to, to salaries. Um, and there's only so much money because the state tells us how much money we're going to get, and that's all we got. I appreciate your hard work as well. Yes. Three, three and a half percent in the paper, but the paper didn't mention 3.75 for our instructors. That is correct. Yeah. You are correct. Okay, we, have a, a motion? we have a motion. Well, wait a minute now. Yep. Still need a motion. We still need a motion on this one. Yep. I'll make a motion that we approve the um, instruct staff, school district administrators, and the instructional um, increases to personnel. A motion by Ms. Counts and a second by Ms. Powers. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. C, I ask the board to 
approve the updated substitute teacher and support pay rates. This would include the $15 minimum wage for our staff, for our substitutes as well, and it will go into effect September 18th, which is the beginning of a new payroll cycle, and that's why we selected that date. I move approval to update the, super, uh, the substitute teacher and support rate pay. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Kennedy, a second by Ms. Counts. Any further questions or comments? I pulled this one because we had a retired teacher come to our board several times and asked why we couldn't pay a little bit more. And now we're paying, um, and he's a certified teacher, so he could come and help us out with substituting for $170 a day. And I don't think you can go many other places in Citrus County and make $170 a day. That is correct. So hopefully, and the other thing that's happening, I think, in our elementary schools is we've tried to talk to some of the um, the parents, whether mother or father is, is home after they drop their children off, and the principals are working with them just to substitute at their school so they don't have to go in. They still have to do our training, but they don't have to be afraid that they're going to go to Citrus High School. But if they want to substitute in our elementary schools where their children is there, um, we're going to pay them now anywhere from $120 to $140 a day. That's a nice little side income for mom yes. and That's excellent. Well, and we don't want to forget that we did raise this last year. I mean, yeah, we, you we are correct. Yeah. Till last year, so I mean, I think we're moving in the right direction here. Um, so I'm all in favor. All right. Any more comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries five zero. I asked the board for letter D. I asked the board to approve the salary increases for non-union employees for the 22-23 school year. And this is reflective of what was agreed upon by CCA and Teamsters for support. Okay. I'll make a motion that we approve the salary increase for non-union employees for 22-23 school year. Second. Motion by Mr. Dodd and a second by Mr. Kennedy. Motions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries by zero. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. So I come before you today um, asking approval of the salary increase for the CCA classified and professional technical employees. I'll go ahead and make a recommendation. I'm sorry, make the motion to approve the salary increase for CCEA classified and professional technical for 2022-2023. We have a motion by Mr. Kennedy, a second by Ms. Counts. Do we have any questions or comments? Your, your smile indicates that you're almost as happy as probably all the bargaining units. <laughs> Two yes. more votes, is that what yes. you're saying? <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, next, uh, we ask that the uh, board approve the instructional salary and supplement pay increase for uh, CCEA instructional. Move approval for the salary and supplemental pay increase for uh, CCEA. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Ms. Counts, a second by Ms. Powers. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. And lastly, we ask that you approve the new instructional salary placement schedule for our instructional staff, even with the new starting salary. I move approval um, about, for the new CCEA Instructional Appendix A um, salary placement scale. Second. Motion by Ms. Counts, a second by Ms. Powers. Any questions or comments? So I'll, I'll make a comment. I didn't pull this item, but I did discuss it with Mr. Ballmer in reference and Ms. Um, Ms. Swain in reference to the, uh, the years of experience. So we are making some changes to the years of experience. So now instead of it being 18 years experience to get placed higher, it's 15 years. But the reason that we can't go less than that, because I've talked a little bit about why can't we make it less, and it is truly a budgetary issue. I thought it might be interesting for you to kind of explain that because, you know, it would be nice for a teacher with 10 years of experience to be able to come to our district 
and not have to start at the first step of the scale. And so, oh, oh I, I understand. Can you explain that a little bit? Because it, it, it's interesting. It, it truly is. It's it's math. I mean, it's the money. We don't have the money there to do it. But uh, I'm hoping we're going to be able to chip away on this. Well, what we run into is that all of our teachers currently who are between the years of zero and 15 years of experience that currently work for Citrus County Schools fall into that category of until we just had this market adjustment that the board's talking about now, they would be where the starting teacher salary is. So if we brought in someone with 10 years of experience from somewhere else and moved them higher than someone who was here for 15 years, that would cause a problem. What we probably have is we'd have our employees resign, come back and get hired again and go through all of that paperwork. Whenever the state required us to get up to 47.5, it caused us to move from 38,600 up to 47.5 in the span of three years, instead of a gradual increase. So what that did was that created compression on our scale, as it did everywhere else in the state, as did the $15 an hour minimum wage uh, did for our support staff. So by doing that, we're trying to find a way to chip way to to, uh, to bring in our new teachers with their years of experience, but not have them leapfrog over people who have spent that same amount of time in Citrus County. Because if they've been here for 15 years and someone comes in with 15 and makes more than them, that, that just didn't seem right. It is a negotiated item. We meet with CCA um, each year. We'll meet with them again, um, and we will hammer something out next year that will hopefully uh, increase our attractiveness to to employees coming here versus somewhere else from one of our neighboring counties. So our starting pay, which is very competitive now, yes. right, is continued to gone up. Now it's forty seven nine, I believe, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and so as we see that continuing to boost up, we still have this compression issue that we need to try to address these people in the, in the middle here. And I think that can be the way that we can do that if you know as time goes by we those years of experience matter, I believe, and so if we can work out a way to pay someone that's new to the district with 10 or more years experience, um, pay them at a higher rate than starting teacher pay, I would like to work towards that. I know mm -hmm. you explained it very well, and, and Ms. Swain, I mean, I understand, you know, we wouldn't want someone to resign and go through the hiring process yeah. again and earn another couple thousand dollars. That doesn't make any sense. But we, we got to keep working on that, um, and I, I just I thought it was an interesting thing. But again, I'm glad we're, we're making some adjustment because oh, yeah. instead of 18 years, now it's down to 15, right? Mm -hmm. And now hopefully we can continue on that track. Oh, we will. And and I have to agree with Mr. Dodd on this. I um, I understand the compression and the formulas and the impacts, but what I also understand is we have 30 plus teaching positions open, and that impacts our teachers too. And that impacts our students. And while it's a struggle to figure, you know, how to do this, I think we we need to to look at this more closely if we're going to stay competitive. We do have other districts that are looking at doing this, districts that are doing this. And so at some point, I think we're, you know, I don't want to get into a bargaining conversation here, but I do think that we need to be open to it, and, and I mean everyone, to yeah. say how do we do, how do we stay competitive? so that we can continue to bring um, excellence to Citrus County, whether that's someone fresh out of college or whether that's somebody maybe that moves to our state and uh, is coming with a wealth of experience too. And I'll just add you, because you say bring them into Citrus County, but I would also like to add to keep our <coughs> teachers that here, here. have been in our classroom for years because they've been insulted enough with all of the state stuff that's coming down from Tallahassee. And we've tried our best in Citrus County to, to assage them the insult um, that they're, they've endured. Um, and so I commend you for trying to figure out how we can do it as quickly as possible because I think our retention is very, very important for our veteran teachers. Thank you, Ms. Palmer. Anyone else? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, you look a whole lot better. <laughs> Good afternoon. I um, am asking for approval of the school health services plan, but I wanted to begin with um, by saying that um, 
Mr. Dodd and I had conversation about an item that is in the um, school health services plan that is coming up and it's very, very, um, it's here, it's real. And it's item 37, if you were to keep flipping, I don't know what page it's on, but um, they're numbered, you know, one through 37 is the one that speaks about the parental rights and um, the writing that was put in there because of the time that we uh, compiled the contract says that it's, we were making revisions. So those revisions have been done um, to align with what is in the parental rights, which in this particular case was um, creating uh, documents that um, have parents opting in for health services and um, uh, like health services in the clinic, screenings and things such as that. So if you see that in there and it, you know, not real sure about it, those, uh, those items, um, that item has been completed and it is, um, it's in, it's working. It's, we're, we're, you know, we're, we've implemented it. Right. And so, you know, I would like to suggest that we reword that to okay. show that. Um, because I don't want anyone to get the sense that we're not following the Parents' Bill of Rights. We are. And I don't want anyone anywhere who could get a copy of this document saying that we're, well, we're in the process and we haven't done it, but we're working on it. No, it's there, right? Mm -hmm. We've done it. It's, yes. We're following the law. So I thought that there, that we, before we approve this, should um, discuss how we can better state that on the right column. The right column is the implementation. The middle column is the program standard or requirement. Right. So, I'm, and when I talked with Ms. Humbaugh, we, we talked about maybe saying that the district is meeting the, 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 the law, the Parents' Bill of Rights, uh, and revisions have occurred or are in the process. I'm not sure, but I just thought it would be a good discussion. Well, I thought that was right with you because I was looking at some of our policies and I had to talk with Mr. Dixon before the meeting. Um, about the policies, and, and so we were talking there about policy 5.51. That's right. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that, that we can update those policies, I think, to match our health plan. Does that make sense? Because we're constantly changing and updating the policies according to the state. Um, so if the state has changed in the Parental's Bill of Rights, we, we could amend the, the point five one any time. Or we could just say then we could add that the district is in compliance with, I'm sorry? Oh, I could say the district is com in compliance with the Parents' Bill of Rights. I just want to make sure it's clear to everyone that we're in compliance. Absolutely. I just want to this board to know House Bill 1557, um, one of the portions of that bill, it, it, was, give, it was a memo sent out on June 6th by Commissioner Oliva about how there's going to be some guidance created by the state on how to interpret certain of the language. So that still is in flux. Portions of that bill still may have changes coming up, just to keep you aware. Could, and, and maybe it's a Mr. Uh, Bradshaw clarification or question, could there just not be dialogue along the lines of what Mr. Dodd saying, but then citing statute and our policy of saying, you know, uh, this will conform with uh, the Parents' Bill of Rights House Bill, you know, 17 or whatever. I'm sure there's now actually a legislative 1557, but I'm not sure. There may even be citing of statute at this point uh, that we can cite on that. It's made a statute. It's, yeah, that's what I was going to say. So, so do that. And, and we can even codify that with our policy number uh, that it refers to if that's necessary. Or to, just, to, 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 to codify what Mr. Dodd is suggesting, but maybe to to protect us by, because of Mr. Brett, uh, Mr. Bittner is reflecting that we may have additional guidance coming. So if we just reference that we will comply, but then we comply to and we, we cite the statute uh, specifically. The, uh, um, there is some additional guidance coming out because the uh, DOE is supposed to, there's a couple federal lawsuits that are going on and it's gonna give us some more guidance. So it's, uh, so if we're following and complying with it, then we would be doing what is necessary versus I think what Mr. Dodd is yeah. concerned with. Yeah, what can we state on that right side that says it's implemented? And this deals with the health issue with parental consent 
um, prior to providing, assisting, or arranging to provide health care services or prescribing medicinal drugs to a minor child. This is like number 37? 37, it's yes. Right. I just, I wanted to put that, I wanted to have the implementation in there. Like with, for CCSB policy 5.51 health services plan? Mm -hmm. Right. Is in the process of revision to include the specific language indicated by, yeah, by uh, the parental, uh, I can't remember the oh. exact. Health Bill of Rights for statutes. Right. I guess what I'm saying is, I don't want, I mean, when you say you're in the process, it means that maybe we're, we're still not, working we're still working yeah. on it, right? That that's the word, that's what I'm catching, that's what I'm getting me. I want someone to read right. this in some office and say, oh, they're not following the law. Then compliance with it, then yes. Then maybe I guess the question is, is move it all the way up to the top into the summary and just put it as part of the summary and because because down below there is more than just really one section yep. that that's the case. So if we put it in the summary, which is probably what most people are going to first read. Mr. Bettner's agreeing with that. We you know we can do that. With that y'all are picking out the color of the drapes and that's not me. Right. I'm sure. Well, we can do it. <laughs> we can do it very easily with this. The process of revision is not our revision, it's the, the state's ongoing revision. So if we just said the process uh, is in um, in the state's hands and being revised periodically, and we will conform as, think, as I revised. Think, I don't think the statute's going to change. I think what's going to happen is the way people would interpret the mm -hmm. statute is what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, that's why I think if if you put in the summary and just add to the bottom of the uh, of the first paragraph that you know this plan will continue to conform with the Parents Bill of Never Rights, you know, Florida statute. Because you, as you're saying, yeah. we're not going to be fun. We are following, and, right. and we're going to be. I understand what you're saying. I'll give you Mr. Bender. Okay, do you want to go something up with summary instead of down there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm good either way. I just, but, but we are going to approve this today, so I don't know if, if I don't know what the time constraint is on approving. If you can come back to the workshop meeting in two weeks, or if we need to do it. I mean, I'm ready to approve it if we know what we want to say. But I don't have any problem because we've we've always done our policies and changed your policies, amended our policies to This is not a public hearing. No, it's not. So you can change, you can change it so, to next meeting. Okay, so you just want to wait till next meeting and you guys can look at that? Is that Do you have enough time, Ms. Ms. Humboldt? Um, I, I, the sooner the better. I'd like to get it approved. I mean, if you'll let me get it approved and get it, you know, the signature and then add that. Um, I would rather add something and approve it today, and then if we need to add again, we can do that. But I, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to approve it without why having. Don't that. Just, why don't you just pass this for a little bit? And let me call this okay. And see if we can come up with okay. Sure. That sounds good. Yeah. And listen, the point here too that we want to make is with our our parents to make sure they're filling out these consent forms, right? Because they're supposed to go online and in, in the Skyward. I know the schools are working with. Uh, parents who are they've been given some paper copies is that right Ms. Humbaugh you said so some parents that aren't getting it done they're giving paper copies to but we want to have that's the law right we, we need to have their consent it's not an it's not an opt-out it's not an opt-out yeah. right opt -in. yeah so it's going to be important that we that our parents are updating their student records and permissions mm -hmm. Reports. We've been running reports. We have schools calling uh, parents. We work diligently on it at Open House. Miss um, Androsky runs reports and shares those with us that it will come up and show us who has, um, you know, opted in and who has not. <coughs> It's, it's the, the clerical staff predominantly that will notify the parent. We, we don't want to continue to encourage paper copies though. So we make every effort avenue where parents can come in, use our computer if they, you know, if they don't have that. Um, because it, it's easier to have it all done electronically. <coughs> Um, instead of it being filled out and then schools having to go back in and manually enter that information. Ms. Humbo, when you say reports, I'm, I'm assuming that means you run a report of those that have not complied Correct. yet with it, with it, and then some there's contact made with the family to ensure that that 
Yes. That compliance. We've been doing this since before school started. We've been working on it. So. So I need it's to make a motion to table it until later in the meeting. Would that be the right? Um, you just pass it. You, you table it to, it to another meeting. You just pass okay. it right now. Just pass on it now. Okay. 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 You have to take care of C two. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. So the next um, item that um, we're asking approval for is the um, impact diversion program contract and impact diversion referral form. And again. I spoke with Mr. Dodd prior to today and um, just want to make it perfectly clear that this diversion is between Citrus County Schools and Impact Counseling. It has nothing to do with it being a diversion with law enforcement for, um, for drug and um, alcohol. So this is not a diversion to arrest. It's not a diversion program that we are going to enter into with the Department of Juvenile Justice and mm -hmm. the Department of the Marge Snow and Douglas Act to make sure that we are um, including that in, uh, what is it, CJNet or one of the, one of the um, data um, sources. So it's not a diversion to arrest program. Nope. And uh, all these cases are still going to be reported to law enforcement like they normally would. I mean, as far as a drug, yeah. a drug issue, mm -hmm. but I thought it was interesting because um, that it will give students who are vaping an opportunity for counseling. It, it'll give us another um, tool in the toolbox, maybe, right, as far Correct. as dealing with these kids mm -hmm. uh, to keep them in school because vaping has gotten... Is, is, a, is a problem. And we're talking THC. We're baby. talking THC. Correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Which makes it um, a, a crime. So um, our principals know, everyone knows that we have this opportunity to use as discipline, but it's not going to be used in lieu of a criminal report, in lieu of any arrest or crime. No, depend, you know, when they arrest based on the amount, um, they will continue to issue teen court citations for um, THC, um, where, and again, even like now, we all know that is totally separate from what the school does. Right. Um, when they do an, a teen court citation, or they write a report, or they make an arrest, this has nothing to do this with This is that. not going to be part of the civil citation that teen court has. We're not no. uh, acting on their behalf at all. No. This is going to be uh, a separate issue that uh, the district okay. is going to have. Um, so we also had talked about the fact that it was in the contract. It's only going to be uh, delivered at the Renaissance, but I understand that that is... Yeah, that has changed since then um, because the uh, program is offered at night. Um, it's not anything that students can do during the day, um, which also puts the responsibility back on them. So that needs to be in a place that impact is responsible for we can't do it on our campuses at nighttime with an sro and all that so there's a location in lacanto and one in inverness that um the uh, parents will be given and they can make the choice where where they attend the counseling at night so did you come up with a way to change we we're going to change the 2.6.1.4 on the one that says it's only at Renaissance? Yes, I will get, I've already talked to Miss Adele and we'll get that back loaded up to her. Okay. Mm -hmm. So are we going to approve this today then? Or are we going to wait for, is that, we're going to approve it today? So I, I how, is so. That, how is that wording going to be then? It's group, group substance abuse education counseling will be provided at I'll put locations. the one address, the impact counseling address, it's, it's a church address. And then I'll put it with their other one that is one of their actual offices. Okay. It'll be, um, it'll apply to um, middle and um, high school, those that we're getting this from. Mm -hmm. Ms. Humble, and I, I know the answer, but just because I think it's important following the previous conversation, will this, this will be part of compliance with um, HB 70, uh, 1557, where I'm assuming will parents not have to sign off on this as well on the W version? They will. They they will. Yes, they will have to agree to the diversion. There will still be that option of um, alternatively being placed. Mm -hmm. um, this is our effort for um, 
first time possessions to be given a, an intensive drug and alcohol um, preventative and substance use and abuse program that will hopefully prevent um, you know prevent from students from repeating correct and, that, and that's what I that's how what I understood and I'm excited that we're mm -hmm. we're, we're furthering our toolbox and that's why I say I, I, it was my understanding that parents would have to sign off on this yes. as part of that just like they would in a due process um, this would be this they're going into the diversion instead of going through that's that correct of, so thank you mm -hmm. And with that, the 2.13 on the cost, the $680 to $360 to maybe free with, with um, Medicaid insurance, that's if, if a child is vaping and is given this as an option and they're not a Medicaid uh, participant um, or eligible, I should say, um, the parents going to have to agree that there's a cost to this. That's correct. correct. And that's right. in... The contract part that the parent signs, right. um, Impact has expressed every willingness to work with everyone regardless. Right. You know, they do have the insurance building, they have a sliding scale um, that they will make every effort that they can, just like they do now with the counseling they provide at the Renaissance. I was right there on the pay too with how do they pay and stuff like that because it's going to be two hours a week. Maybe, maybe additional hours if possible for eight weeks. Um, but if the child misses two sessions, he's gonna be booted out. Um, what if the parents have already paid? I would gather, I would assume that, and I should be assume yeah. that they would. Um, I mean, I, I can't see any parents that receive a, working over 680 bucks and then saying, I can't get it back because you, you kicked my kid out. I would think that they would provide a refund and we would, we have to hold them accountable for, mm -hmm, for the it, eight sessions. It's been, has done a pretty good job yes. in our district. So I don't know if supposed to give impact, but, so that's you know, why maybe I'm a yes. little weary. Um, and they have been like spot on with making sure they keep track of those who finish, don't finish, all of that. That um, I mean, you bring up a very good question, and I I feel like I know the way they operate enough to know that they would provide a refund, and the the student I, would have the. I'm other. just a little skeptical because there's so much grant money coming from the government, federal and state, for, for mental health now. Well, this won't have anything to do with this, grant money. They're doing it on their own. No, ma'am. Yes. Self yes. Self-sufficient. Okay. Mm -hmm. but and they'll have to know that going in, which we talked about. They that. totally will know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you know, we're dealing with troubled students, and they do need help. So they're going to have the threat of you miss two in a row, you're out. Mm -hmm. um, and but I would like to know that the parents would be run, refunded if they paid up front. I don't know mm -hmm. what, if they've been around for a long time in the history, they they should have to be able to answer that question. Yeah. So also 4-5 is the, this agreement shall automatically renew each school year, Mr. Bradshaw, that's um, on the on 4.5, automatically renewal. Um, we don't need to do anything different on that as far as, and we're not paying any money for this. Yeah, we have a termination clause in there. There's a termination clause, right? Okay. The, just the auto renewals. Okay. okay. It, can, it can roll over. I mean, it's not, it's not a funded contract as far as money is concerned, and money's coming from other places, and it also has a... So we don't need a funding out provision, we have a 30-day termination. Okay. Every, so, every so I will make a motion to approve um, to approve the impact diversion program contract and impact diversion referral form with the agreed statement in 2.6.1.4 that the counseling will be provided at two locations as Ms. Humble has mentioned yes. to the board. Second. Give it, give it to Ms. Power. Yeah. All right. Um, Mr. Dodd made the motion, Ms. Power seconded. Any more questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, it's 5 p.m. Thank you. So we're going to go to a public hearing. I need to recess the one we're in and open up We do the code of student conduct first. All right. <coughs> code of student
student conduct. Code of conduct is the amendment. Is there any reason we can't make a motion? No, no reason. I'm going to go ahead and make a motion uh, for the uh, that we approve the 2022-2023 code of conduct approval for the amended version from uh, June 23rd, 2022. I have a motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Mr. Bottom. Any questions or comments? Just that again, we this was something we had reviewed, and uh, it's why we uh, can move forward. Even, I feel like at this time. All right, because yeah, I think we passed it before we reviewed it in depth. In depth, thank <laughs> you, Mr. I, I did not get the box around my assault thing under zero tolerance, but I'll I'll wait until next year. I, I don't believe this is the, the end for the advertising. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, yes, yes. But I I will say that this this code of conduct I think is probably one of the tightest ones I've seen in years. And if the teachers and administrators enforce it, I think we can get the kids back on track. We're losing teachers because of the lack of respect in the classroom and, and the code being too loosey-goosey. So to our administrators and our teachers, this is what you've asked for. We're giving it to you. Now you handle it. So do we have to have students? Do we have to have public comment? Have public comment. Public comment. Yes. Okay. Is there any public comment on the amendment two times? Any public comment on the amendment? Third time's a charm. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. And it's a mod cover this year. I think that's got to be noteworthy for some reason, but I don't know what. <laughs> uh, it's Breast Cancer Month. Oh, okay. oh. <laughs> thank you. the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Millage rates are 4.0230 for operating purposes. This includes a prior period of adjustment of 0 0.0160 and 1.5000 for capital outlay purposes for a total of 5.5230 mills. The final budget for the fiscal year of 2022-2023 totals $326,976,42. Is there anyone here who wishes to address the board as to the millage level levy or the budget proposed for the 2022-2023 fiscal year? State your name when you get there, and you'll have three, three minutes. Yes, good evening. My good name is Eric Bergstrom, and I have a question for you is all. Why do senior citizens continue to have to pay school tax at the age of 60? This makes no sense whatsoever. Already paid for two generations by the time you reach 60. Why getting plagued with a third? I do not. Would you like to respond? I can tell you what I used to tell when I was running for office in 16. I taught at First River High School for I taught total for 28 years from 21 and And I'm a senior citizen. And 
when I was running for election, I had that same question come at the Chronicle Forum. And I said, I used to tell my sophomores at First River High School, you will graduate, you will get a diploma, and you will get a good job, and you will contribute to my Social Security. If we're not educating our children and getting them good jobs, your Social Security will, will evaporate because they're working and they're paying for our Social Security. That's not a good answer whatsoever. That is, that, that's totally a role. That is. And I was just at Winn Dixie the other day, and the girl, 20 something, in the bakery department asked the other one there, uh, excuse me, um, is 8 plus 4, 12? This is what we're paying for? Seriously. And there's no rhyme or reason the senior citizens have already paid have to pay more and again. They should be exempt from paying any further school taxes. And, and where's the two years during the pandemic money that was allocated to the school districts? There should be a surplus. There should not even be an increase. You shouldn't even, you've got to be ashamed to be even asking for an increase. Well, probably need to address your concerns to Social Security and the federal government. We don't really have to any. They're not the Board of Education. You are. All we, of you. We, we don't set our. Yeah, we don't set it. We don't set it. Set by it. the legislature, set by yeah. the Board We're told what to do by Tallahassee and the federal government. Things like that. We don't have, we don't, we this don't is have not discretion to level. You don't set the millage rate. No, we don't. No. No, no we don't. We, do not. we accept it from the state that they give to us. Oh, I think this is a disgrace. I really do. It's not our, it's, it's not our doing. It's way over our heads. Way over our pay grade. Totally unacceptable. Y'all should be fired. Okay. Anybody else have any comments? Is there a motion to include the supplemental millage rate of 0 0.7480 mills and the capital outlay millage rate of 1.5000 mills in the resolution determining revenues and millages levied as required by law? I move to include the supplemental millage rate of 0 0.7480 mills and the capital outlay millage rate of 1.50 zero zero mills in the resolution by deter determining revenues and villages levied as required by law. I second the motion. Doug Dodd moved and Linda Power seconded the motion to include the supplemental millage rate of 0 0.7480 mills and the capital outlay millage rate of 1.5000 mills in the resolution determining revenues and millages levied as required by law. Is there any discussion on the motion? <clears throat> Resolution of the District School Board of Citrus County, Florida, determining the amount of revenues to be produced and the millage to be levied for the general fund, for the district's local capital improvement fund, and for district debt service funds for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2022 and ending June 30, 2023. Whereas section 1011.04 Florida statutes requires that upon receipt of the certificate of the property appraiser given the assessed valuation of the county and of each of the special tax school districts, the school board shall determine by resolution the amounts necessary to be raised for current operating purposes and for debt service funds and the millage to be levied for each such fund, including the voted millage comp. Excuse me. And whereas section 1011.71 Florida statutes provides for the amounts necessary to be raised for local capital improvements outlay and the millage to be levied, and whereas the certificate of the property appraiser has been received, therefore be it resolved by the district school board that the amounts necessary to be raised as shown by the officially adopted budget and the millage is necessary to be levied for each school fund of the district for the fiscal year are as follows. Number one, district school tax non-voted levy. Certified taxable value, $13,954,936,486. Require local effort, amount to be raised, $43,659,973. Millage levy, 3.2590 mills. Prior period funding adjustment millage, amount to be raised, $214,348. Millage levy, 0 0.0160 mills. 
uh, total required millage, $43,874,321. Millage levy, 3.2750 mills. Number two, district school tax discretionary millage, non-voted levy. Certified taxable value, $13,954,936,486. Description of levy, discretionary operating, amount to be raised, $10,020,761. Millage levy, 0 0.7480 mills. Number three, district school tax additional millage, voted levy. Certified taxable value, blank. That is just blank, so I will move on to number four. District local capital improvement tax, non-voted levy. Certified taxable value, $13,954,936,486. Description of levy, local capital improvement. Amount to be raised, $20,095,109. Millage levy, 1.5000 mills. Number five, district debt service tax. Voted levy, that is blank. Number six, the total millage rate to be levied exceeds the rollback rate computed pursuant to Florida Statute Section 200.065, friend one, closed friend by 6.12%. Having heard the rec resolution and there is a motion on the floor, is there any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Is there a motion to adopt the final proposed budget as the final adopted budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2022-2023 fiscal year? I move to adopt the final budget proposed, I'm sorry, the final proposed budget as the final adopted budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2022-2023 school year. Second motion. <coughs> Mr. Kennedy has made the motion and his counts has seconded. The motion to adopt the final proposed budget is the final adopted budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion to adopt the final budget as the final budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2022-2023 fiscal year, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. A resolution of the Citrus County School Board adopting the final budget for fiscal year 2022 and 2023. Whereas the School Board of Citrus County, Florida did pursuant to chapters 200 and 1011 Florida statutes approve final village rates and a final budget for the fiscal year July 1, 2022 to June 30, 2023, and whereas the School Board of Citrus County set forth the appropriations and revenue estimates for the budget for fiscal year 2022 through 2023, and whereas at the public hearing and in full compliance with Chapter 200 Florida statutes, the School Board of Citrus County adopted the final millage rates and the final budget in the amount of $326,976 thousand forty two dollars for fiscal year 2022 through 2023 now therefore be it resolved that the attached budget of the school board of citrus county including the millage rates as set forth therein is hereby adopted by the school board of citrus county as the final budget for the categories indicated for the fiscal year july 1 2022 to june 30 2023 is there a motion to approve the resolution adopting the final budget i move to approve the resolution adopting the final budget Second. Linda Powers moved and Sandy Count seconded the motion to adopt the resolution adopting the final budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Is there any discussion on the motion? Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'd like to ask the attorney one question is. I'm sorry, Mr. Bradshaw. <laughs> Mr. Bradshaw, are you aware of any statutorial power that would enable us as a local school board to be able to exempt someone from paying taxes based on their age? So we would not be able to provide any exemption at this level. Those exemptions come from the legislature. Thank you, Mr. Bradshaw. That is all, Madam Chair. 
Did I say when the power is moved and Sandy counts? Yes, I did. Yeah, number four. All those in favor of the motion to adopt the resolution adopting the final budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2022-2023 fiscal year say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Adjourn the meeting. And we'll go back to the regular meeting. Yes, I am. <laughs> where do we leave off? Um, we're probably at 515. Well, we might want to come back to the uh, school health services plan. If it's okay. Ready. Were you looking for something just as the school board? So the school board will comply with Florida statute 1014.06 parental consent for health care services. Something as simple as that's, that. Is, yeah, or is in compliance with or, or will comply with whatever. Yeah, we'll comply. comply. Okay, that's fine. Okay, and then, you know, and then you know, I guess you're going to take it out of 37 or, or you want that or do you want that in 37 or are you all going to move it up to the summer? And well, we could add it to 37, and if we want to put it in the summary, I think if you put it in the summary, if there's ever any question as to whether any of it yeah. needs to comply, it's fine if you want to keep it in 37, but I think if you put it up there, you so cover the whole document. The school board will comply with Florida Statute 1014.06, parental consent for health care services. Yes, that's, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. I, think we should, I think we should put it 37, but Thomas... No, I, put it I think places. we can put it 37. We'll put it both places. We'll put it in both places. Okay. Yeah. All right, then I will make the motion to approve the 2022-24 school health services plan with those with that added wording for number 37 and in the summary. The school board will comply with Florida Statute 1014.06, parental consent for health care services. Yes, I second that motion. Okay, Mr. Dodd made the motion. Mr. Kennedy seconded it. Okay, questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion carries 5 0. And do we have any citizens' comments at this point? Okay. And now we're ready for calendar committee representative, <laughs> chairperson. Okay. <laughs> So Ms. Crowell, the chairperson, couldn't be here. So I'm Jennifer Story, Coordinator of Research Accountability, and I'm going to um, get feedback on her behalf. So I know it's only September of this school year, but we're already looking ahead to our calendar for the, the following school year, the 23-24. So a little bit about um, what we have as far as the, the timeline for the calendar. I feel like this might be the wrong PowerPoint slide on here. I wonder if this one still had last year's up there. Well, we do have paper copies, We're just in case that Thursday happens. now. <laughs> we are meeting Thursday. So I'm gonna say, that doesn't look like my presentation. So I'll take you through the steps, and Ms. Hamzawi will give you a paper copy so that you have it. So for the timeline, um, we are at the point where we are meeting Thursday, and Ms. Counts is serving on the calendar committee with us. Uh, we do have a committee that is made up of several members. And there is a representative from each of the levels, elementary, middle, high, as well as our departments. And we also have administrators and parents who serve on the committee that are helping to make the decisions. Now, for the actual committee itself, while we have those representatives at each level, there is a representative at each of the schools. And they gather feedback and then give it to their, their representative. So if a teacher at Central Ridge Elementary has any feedback, they share it with the elementary representative, Ms. Shantz, and then she brings it to the calendar committee. For your actual timeline, you'll see the yellow highlighted line there. The chairperson will seek input from the superintendent and school board, and that's today. That's highlighted to show where we are currently at. Now, as far as the processes that have taken place, as I said, there were committee members, including CCA, um, and they're notified 30 days or more in advance of the calendar and the process. Uh, the list of the calendar committee members and the representative groups are posted at each of the schools and they seek input and share that as the representative. 
And then the notification of the calendar committee meeting two weeks prior to the meeting, which is going to take place this upcoming Thursday. Uh, the meeting will, will occur. We will develop two to three calendar options. And this is where we get feedback from the schools as well as the board and superintendent to help us in guiding that process of developing those calendars. Uh, we typically do two to three options. That's why you have both there. Last year we ended up with two because a lot of times based on the, the guidance that we have, both through statute and through what we have feedback from other staff members and the board, it does require um, some of the calendars to look very similar. So if you have three calendars, sometimes two of them are almost identical. So we did two last year, which provided some differences between them. And I know Ms. Counts served on one of those and you can, she can kind of attest to that, that you know, when you're trying to make it different, sometimes it can get a little bit difficult and a little sticky as you're working through. It's very secretive. Yes. And then you want to see what the other committee is doing because you want to make sure your calendar is better than theirs as you're working through that process. As you're working with Sally's rent. Yes. You want to know if you won. So the calendar committee, they use that input and they finalize those calendar options, which are then um, shared with the schools. And oftentimes, um, you know, they have them up, they have discussions, they have meetings about it. And the SAC committee also gets a vote on that calendar. And all of our SAC committees, this has already been brought to their attention and their dates of their meetings have been scheduled within that window to ensure that we do get a vote back from each of the SACs. The calendar um, that then has the majority of the support, it will be brought back to you for approval. So that's the basics of the timeline. Next, you'll see some things to remember and previous board feedback. You'll see that noted there with an asterisk. So the student and teacher start date, uh, students aren't able to start any earlier than August 10th, and that's the statute. Now, for the upcoming year that we're looking at, it does fall on a Thursday. In the past, it was noted that the board um, would not like a start date on a Friday. So we just want to think about, you know, is the Thursday okay, having the Thursday, Friday, or any other input that you would have. The 180 days for the students, um, you know, that's something that we, we have to have as well. But one thing to keep in mind is feedback from the schools. They like to have that equitable semesters, you know, as close as we can get to 90 days for each of the semesters, 45 within the nine weeks. This helps with especially credits that are earned in high school, but also exams and making sure that they're equal. The 196 days for teachers, knowing that six of those are paid holidays. We have Labor Day, Thanksgiving Day, day after Thanksgiving, MLK, Good Friday, Memorial Day, as well as 10 non-student contract days where they have work days, they have professional development, and knowing that we want to have at least those 30 hours there for PD. Um, in the past, the feedback included that we wanted more time for work days and PD during pre-planning week. So just looking to see if that's something we would like to continue. Also knowing that in that first nine weeks, we have the parent conference day for our elementary and middle. Um, that is actually coming up in this current calendar on September 23rd, we have that Friday. So knowing that that's something that we would continue moving forward. Looking at testing windows and FTE, knowing that we don't want the calendar to have any conflicts that are going to jeopardize the implementation of the assessments and also having um, you know, our students in attendance during FTE. Final exams in high school, knowing that they are administered at the end of each semester. You know, it, it's been used in the past that we want to make sure that before we leave for Christmas break, that that semester is ending and our high school students are taking those semester exams instead of having to finish that course when they come back in January and have the exams. Our holiday breaks, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and spring break, and it has been confirmed that the dates that you see in front of you are the actual fair dates. Um, so knowing that if we want to keep spring break in a line with the fair week, that the March 25th through the March 31st of 2024 are those dates. And then of course the last day of school, so knowing that our testing begins May 1st and then ends on May 29th, and looking at do we want our school year to end before, after Memorial Day, teacher work days at the end of the year. So again, just want to seek your input on any of those things that are noted as um, previous requests from the board, if we want to keep those, if we have anything new that we would like to bring to the calendar committee. Um, you know, some of the things that come up from the calendar committee can include things as um, serious as ending our semesters, and you know, it can be as funny as making sure we have the day after the Super Bowl off. So you know, just keeping in mind any any suggestions or good suggestions. I was going to ask about Thanksgiving. Don't we, don't we have a week off at Thanksgiving? Correct. Okay. 
Sure. So if we want to continue to have that week off, that's something that um, we can definitely note there. Yeah, I was going to say that um, it would be nice to see a calendar option that starts on the Monday. Um, that might be a challenge, but I think it would be worth a discussion to see if uh, rather than starting on August 10th, which is a Thursday, and this board has already said. Wait, can I we, interrupt? We're taking non-negotiables to the calendar committee right now. And one of the reasons that we don't want the too many non-negotiables is because it would be very difficult for us to come up with two if we if it isn't our job to establish thursday well, or monday or wednesday but, but this yeah. isn't an well, we might get one just a suggestion well, well we, no but she's taking non-negotiables to the calendar committee that this is what we want and i can take both non-negotiables and we also do a brainstorming session at the beginning where each of the calendar um, levels, like the elementary, middle, high, will give those, and we can share those um, suggestions as well, but not make it a non-negotiable. Yeah. Well, just like the fair. I mean, we decided that we weren't. It wasn't a non-negotiable that they have to have spring break during the fair week. But what we said is that you got to have the Friday of the fair week off if it's not a, not the whole week. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, if we want to challenge the calendar committee for parents' sake. Maybe parents and, and the elementary schools, you know, how they kind of um, bring their kids in at different times. That could it be that we could start on a Monday? I don't know if it will. It, it, it's probably going to be tight with getting those days in, but it would certainly be worth a look. And Mr. Don, we've talked about that ever since the state said that we can't come back before August the 10th. We've had that conversation for several years now. What happens when it's on Thursday and Friday? I want to know what happens if it's on Saturday. <laughs> uh, it'll be Monday, I promise it'll be Monday. So that has been a discussion. I know that we've talked to Amy and her team about maybe looking at how we can start on Monday. Now sometimes, and remember, the later we start, the closer we go to Christmas. So yeah. it may be um, something we can work and it may not be, but I know they're going to look at that. Or at least have one group look at that. Yeah, that would okay. be an interesting option. That I mean, it may not even get voted in, but you know, it might be interesting to see if, if it can be done. Yeah. You know, to start on a Monday, which is two days later than what um, two school days later than what we could start. But yeah, I think that um, I, I'd be interesting to hear you know the parents' um, um, ideas about that too, um, with what they would feel best with the start of the Thursday would be an issue. I know. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, and, and my only thing is, is it, for one, it, it's difficult having served in as the board rep on the calendar committee. It changes with each yep. each calendar year. It gets progressively more challenging to try and do that. So as long as we don't box them in, um, I'm I'm perfectly fine with that. I find though that whether you start on a Monday or a Wednesday, there is huge differences, even amongst families of like, oh, I love that I'm, my kids only start halfway through the week. I've had some that are like, well, if I'm gonna do it, let's just do it on Monday. Um, but then we also have professional development that becomes an issue and a question. And, and so that's why I'm, I'm always excited to see the options the calendar committee does because you have a lot of stakeholders there. And I think that's what's really important. And I think one thing I know we're gonna face as a calendar committee is, is the testing windows have changed. Um, and we're going to have to deal with that. There's days that are going to be closed mm -hmm. where we've always tried to give, like I remember one time, using a paper calendar, Mr. Kennedy, I came up with work trees because we were trying to, we tried, and everybody's <laughs> looking at, at their electronics <clears throat> trying to come up with a day in April to give the teachers a break before and the kids a break before they started their May testing window. And, and I just looked at my paper calendar and I said, how about Earth Day? <laughs> and we did it and it, it's worked well. So. We have to look for little things like that, but the testing windows are gonna change, and I think that's gonna be a real challenge to the calendar committee this year. And I think we also have looked at these half days that we know parents do not like, especially elementary kids. We, I, we've addressed that, so I, you know that would be another thing too for the calendar committee, in my view, is recommended that we try to limit those, those we, half days. We, we count the half days. Yep, yep. Right. But we also tried, and Mr. Dog, we did I, cut a few out, I even know. after the calendar was set. <coughs> we did cut a few of those out for that purpose. Right. And then I remember one year, we did, um, because we had a parent, an FAA parent on, our, on the committee that I was working on, or the calendar that I was working on. And so she was insisting on having a spring break, so we did a spring break 
not in week, uh, fair week. And it bombed. It, you know, and the, yeah. the teachers and the parents did not vote for it at all. So the, the one that continues to win is the, the spring break with the fair week. Yes. But we'll, we might try it again this year. I don't know. Anybody have any other comments? Any other real non-negotiables that you're dealing with? I think that's good. So then um, we'll we'll continue with the non-negotiables that are there, um, where we have the limiting the half days, knowing that um, spring break and fair week could be the same week, but as long as we have the Friday off, um, having the Thanksgiving break for the one week, and um, you know limiting those half days. So I think that that's a pretty good non-negotiables room to the committee to make some different calendar choices for our staff. And our Christmas uh, Christmas break is still it's Christmas break, which is uh, correct. Good, yes. Yep, we'll still have the Christmas break, and the the team usually does a pretty good job of um, one group will try to leave a little bit earlier before Christmas, and there's usually one that comes back a little bit later. So there's different calendars for those people who enjoy being off before Christmas and those who want to enjoy the time after Christmas. So hopefully those choices help when they're voting. Good. Thank you. Thank you. The budget amendment number 10. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bidler, you got to do budget amendment? No, you don't. <laughs> Ms. Hemmer, are you doing budget amendment number 10? Yes, Ms. Hemmer had to go get some. Sure. And she was back. So if you want to go through the ah. other pieces so she gets back. Okay. Let's look at um, attorney. attorney. Citrus yes, County Fair Association reunification agreement. You don't get to say it today, Mr. Bradshaw. Oh, they get to what? You don't get to say your favorite line. Uh, nothing at this point. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> Never made it. Never made it. That'd be the only four words I say during the meeting. <laughs> so, um, as you know, for the re reunification in the case of a, of a natural disaster or emergency, we, we, we contacted the Citrus County Fair Association. Um, who runs runs the fairgrounds and had quite some lengthy um, negotiation that went on. There's, there's two points that I want to point out to you. They have indicated that they are not going to, their employees are not going to be there. They're going to open the door, let us take over the place, and handle it. Okay? So, um, so and based upon that, they would not agree to two things that are normally in some of these and normally what I would like to have in there an indemnification clause where they would agree to indemnify and hold us harmless. They would not agree to that. It says we're not clean up the place too when we're done. Yeah, we're not gonna be there. And the other would be the um, you know, where they have to be, you know, if they're gonna come into contact with kids, they had to be badged and, you know, just for lunch are compliant because you're basically saying we're gonna unlock the door and let y'all have it. In the, in the case of that. Outside of that, it's the same as most of the other ones, but I did want to bring those two items to your attention. Okay, uh, we've got to go back to the Just Guns for Act. So they're giving it to us. They're not assisting. And so if they were going to assist, then they would have to be, you know, comply with Jessica Lunchford. Okay. Right. But the way we've trained with reunification is it's all our people anyway. I mean, we don't we don't need right. And and then, and normally I also have a, you know reciprocal uh, indemnification. We agree to indemnify them if something were to occur. I mean, we're basically operating that place under an emergency situation. But I usually have it where they agree to indemnify us, and that is in case you know one of their employees hangs around. Or does anything like that. So I, I think you know, yeah. with what you're talking about with the reunification, just have to um, part of the training would be to tell them you look, you need to leave. Who is their attorney? Uh, Larry Haig. And so you talked with Mr. Haig multiple times. And, uh, and Hal Porter, who's still the president or however, who runs the Fair Association, and yeah. all. You know, we I went round and round and round, but. That was as good as it gets, and that's why I wanted to just let y'all know that. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with it. I'm glad that we're able to use that facility. I mean, that's where you we're doing. That's where I also, I also think that if uh, um, anything like that were to happen, the, you, you're, you know, everybody and their mother's going to get sued. <laughs> Oh, I thought you say everybody knows where the fairgrounds are. Well, everybody knows, everybody does know where the fairgrounds are, but you know it's one of those things where I'm, I'm sure you know that Mr. Dodd's sitting on the MSD 
commission, you know, that uh, that you know that's a, that, that's a hot mess. So that's why we're doing, you know, making sure we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's and getting everything that we need to get done. So. And I just want to clarify that this is in the event of a school emergency. Yes. You're talking about a school emergency that involves all of our schools in Citrus County. It doesn't have to involve all of our schools. I mean, if something were to happen at one of the local schools here, then that would be a reunification site. And I think Chief Vincent's working on other sites, correct? Correct. Sorry. Oh, okay. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so this Mr. Dodd knew exactly what I was saying because yes. I, I don't want anybody to know if, say, we have an active suitor deal, that all of our kids are going to go down to the fairgrounds. No, no, multiple places. Multiple places. Multiple places. This just happens to be the fairground is offering us their place. Correct. And other places have been offered too. Yes, ma'am. We shouldn't be doing this in public. <laughs> well, this is a reunification, so it this is, is only yeah. a place it, for it parents is. to reunify. It was right. it was their problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a security plan for security at the reunification. At the reunification, so, correct. We won't discuss the security plan. And, but, and it doesn't. And all the parents are, are going to know where all the reunification sites are. So. And, and just for clarification, this reunification could involve where there's multiple other reunifications that this is just meeting parents at. Uh, correct. So it doesn't mean this is where the students are necessarily going to a no, safe haven. This no, may just be. I think that that's di those are different and, locations. And that's what I was just going to say. Where yeah. the students so that's, need that's to, that's to get transported level. there. Right. So we run through our procedure there of putting them back with their parent or guardian. Correct. I was so. just thinking when. I yeah. still remember when we had the nuclear we're not plant, we make had a nuclear when, disaster. Yeah, we're not going to run from Fiji to the, the fairgrounds. Yeah. yeah. Right. So. Right. Okay, so we need to approve that then with a vote. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll make a motion that we approve the reunification agreement with the Citrus County Fair Association. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Dodd and a second by Ms. Counts. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. And I think, Mr. Bradshaw, you're probably working with uh, Mr. Vincent on the reunification policy, or Ms. Mr. Dixon, I know we've the boards. Yes. And working on that, right? Yes, sir. Because okay. that's obviously something yes. we're And move towards. Based on all that, I have nothing further. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ms. Wilson. Hello. I ran back to get some coffee. You can't read them, but you're going to give them to us. Okay. Well, the rest of the 145, and I. We're not. Um, we're going with our final budget as Budget Amendment Nine from the. Um, let's see. This is September from the July board meeting. So we're not going to have a Budget Amendment Ten. So we need to ask for that to be pulled or.
So like the net pension liability, that's FRS though, right? Yes, so, sir. So how, where does that figure come from? The um, Florida retirement system. For our employees that are retirees. Yes. And, and that's, that's that's if every if we shut down for business on June thirtieth, that's how much we would have owed in FRS to the employees. We have OPEB. We just got that from the actuary at um, I think it was about three o'clock today. That's if we had to pay out all the um, health benefits that gets taken into effect. Like the retirees are entitled to health benefits. Um, that has to be taken in. We hire an actuary to do that. Um, compensated absences is our sick and vacation time that we have to pay out. So it's just the easiest way for me to explain it is if we shut down for business, we closed our doors, and we liquidated our assets and paid our liabilities, this is where we would stand. And that's what... <laughs> so we have to go in and value all the buildings, the depreciation, the assets, and all of that. So this is we bring to you every... Um, at the same meeting that we do the budget at, we bring this to you. Do you have any other questions? So when you had to reconcile the fund statement that we had a three million dollar change in net position, so explain yes. that one to me. That would be the increase in um, pitch and liability, um, OPEB. It'd be an increase in our long term sick leave payout. Also, that our fund balance decreased um, due to you know we're having to spend more of our fund balance. So it takes was, into account right. all kinds of. They're not actual things on our financial statements. We do it once a year. It's, it's called GASB. They implemented it um, about 20 years ago. So that shows the two part of the dip in the unrestricted fund balance. This is, does that have to do with that? It really doesn't. Not really. It kind of does, but not really, because it takes in our real world things that are happening, but and then it takes into account everything else. Our assets are depreciating. Um, you know, we don't have like we don't have vehicles anymore. We have lease vehicles, so those went off of our asset sheets. The lease vehicles aren't on our asset sheets. Um, we've been buying a lot of our computers are under a thousand dollars now. So all those old computers that were showed our assets really high, those have all been surplus. So there's a lot of different things that come into effect on the net the net position. So that net position being a negative means we've grown in liabilities then, is that right? Or is that, or being a negative, is that good it, for us? It just means that we are less than we were a year ago. We are less. So right, that's, so than we were a year ago. Part of that is depreciation. Depreciation, I mean, our cash is lower. We, you know, it takes in that an account, like, like I said, our real world things, but then it also takes into account there's all kinds of calculations and figures we have to do. We hire actuaries. We get money from the FRS. Yep. So the big one is the one that I have to hope we're not going to go out of business on June 3rd. Right. <laughs> well, it's a little late now since it's September 12th. But um, the 348, the one that I emailed you earlier, that's the one that truly shows where we are in our fund ending fund balance <clears throat> and where we start off our budget with. So that's why I got that one to you, because that's really more like our monthly finance. That's your June monthly financial statement. What is involved in the other capital outlay? Other capital outlay? That would be when we purchase um, capital outlay as our buildings, our uh, renovations, our other things, sidewalk expenses. Other capital outlay would be equipment, furniture, buses anything that would be um, capitalized. So we don't capitalize like telephones, but we would capitalize um, the bank queues or the, the TVs, the things that are an, over a certain threshold. So that's our other capital outlay. That isn't truly just buildings and grounds and things like that. Mm -hmm.
Can approve it? I make a motion we approve the 2021-2022 annual financial report. This is the, that's my correct? What I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. But I thought so. I just want to make sure of the ESC 348 and ESC 145. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Kennedy, a second by Ms. Counts. Do we have any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So, Mr. Curie, it's 5 0. To go to the budget update now? Right? Okay. So, budget update, budget, you just approved it. You got your little budget books. The five year work plan is still not available. Um, so we will, um, as soon as that comes, Chuck and I will work together and bring that back to you. Um, and then we'll put everything into a nice bound book and get you a nice bound book for you. Um, you did get your budget book with our current year budget, our current year um, FE, you know, our FEFP and where we're standing on that. Um, we are seeing an increase in the FEFP, but please remember that they're taking most of that back in family empowerment so um, with that said having the um, salaries negotiated ahead of time we were able to prepare a pretty good budget and know where we were going to stand and you know we were able to give them a figure and we worked within that figure so those raises and everything are calculated in this budget that you received and um, that's all in there you know we have the ESSER money and yes we do have you know quite a bit of ESSER money right now but that will be gone in 2024 so we have to remember that you know we can't use that for reoccurring expenses you know it's helping us at this time but after 2024 it's not there anymore so um, that's our budget is extremely high this year you know 326 million that's that's the highest I've ever seen it. You know, Mr. Mullen was saying it's almost tripled since he started. I know it's almost doubled since I started working in the finance department. So a good portion of that is the ESSER money. We also, our um, health, and health insurance fund is included in that now. So, um, you know, it is pretty high. So did you have any questions on the budget that I? I, I have some. Yes. Um, Madam Chair, with your um, first, the millage rate. Yes. How do you receive the millage rate and determine what millage rate that we must charge specifically for a local required effort? Um, I'm given that by, it comes in the FEFP calculations and the final conference report that comes down from the legislature for the, the school boards. Okay, so we wouldn't have discretion as a local body on the general budgets on our required local effort, no, sir, we do not. Okay. And as you notice in the in the budget book, there are many graphs that show the higher our values are going up, the lower our millage rate. So actually, people are paying less millage towards the schools. <coughs> it's just that their property values are increasing. And I think uh, the previous meeting you said we'd be almost a million dollars short from what we were last year, even though the taxes for everybody have gone up, but we're not getting it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, we are a million dollars short in required local effort from last, from last that's year. That's where my second question comes from. So on your summary on the budget, um, I think approximately page 14, mm -hmm. on your student transportation, yes. it says for the 2022-2023 fiscal year, the student transportation allocation for Citrus County is, and I'm just going to uh, approximate that it's $4.7 million. Correct. Is that our total cost for transportation that we incur in our district? I ran the numbers today in between just the salaries and then um, the salaries were about seven million just for the bus drivers <laughs> and the you know the mechanics and the people keeping our buses going and then when we add on the repairs and the fuel we were up um, almost nine million and that doesn't even include the price of the buses themselves which run over a million dollars about one point i think they're up to about 1.2 now Mr. so if it's almost nine million that's i'm not as good at math as you but that's higher than 4.7 yes, so almost double. where does that come from that would come from our fund balance that has to come out of our our base student allocation basically so following that, um, 
we were all excited that we were able to provide um, some teacher salaries. On page 15, uh, we talk about some of the teacher salaries, and I'm going to it. Um, and it says for the 2022-2023 fiscal year, teacher salary increase allocation for Citrus County Schools is approximately 3.9 million. Now, this is, I'm assuming, what the state's given us to say we want you to get to that $47,500. Correct. Is, uh, is that all it cost us to do that? Okay. No. Um, so last year, they gave us 2.7. It cost us... 2.7 million. million, okay. And it cost us just to maintain our increase when we went to the 47, went to 47 first, then 47.5. So just to get to the 47, it cost us almost $4 million to maintain that. And then on top of what we gave them last year was another 1.5. So now we're up to 5.5 over and above and they gave us 2.7, and now they're giving us four, and so to maintain what we did last year, it's costing us $5 million. So we're still having to reach in our pockets to be able to raise those rates. And this year, of course, we had to meet the $15 by October 1st, so that they didn't give us, there's no you know, support up to $15 allocation this and that was salary. for the mandate of the forty seven thousand five hundred dollars to in order for us to maintain that at that's, least that yes that's what the teacher salary increases and, for. and i, I want to make it clear it's not that i'm not happy we're paying that i'm thrilled um especially still going home at night to a teacher um i get lectured still very much that our teachers are not, it doesn't matter she's always a teacher um <laughs> So I, I say that because it does impact the rest of our budget when transportation is, costs us twice, almost twice as much. And, and in this case, those raises, while they're funded from the state and we value that, they're not completely funded in that regard. Correct. So that brings me to the, um, the other piece and that has to do with the family empowerment, which you talked about. Um, our budget, uh, has been impacted by basically it, it comes about six million dollars it looked like this year this is coming year that's what they're estimating is six million so that would mean that our base student allocation for this year that we rate that we got that's that new money they add on to the base student allocation was about 4.3 million yes sir so does that mean that that 4.3 million is in addition to the 6 million that they took from us? No, no, sir. They're, they're giving us 4.3 million more in base student allocation, but they're withholding almost six of, of it. So really we're at an, a, a deficit at this point um, of almost 1.7 to meet that 6 million. We never see, we never see that funding. Um, the FEFP last year stated that we were to receive, um, let me get on my paper here. You're talking um, about the family empowerment. Yeah, program. we were supposed to get 55.3 million in FEFP. What was received by the school district in our bank account was 50.4. So they with, we never even see that money. That money goes straight to the private schools. It never come, doesn't flow through us like charter school revenue does or DJJ flows through us and then we write them checks. Family empowerment, we never even see, we don't. But it shows in the base student allocation. It shows in the base student allocation, yes. And, and again, I'm very grateful that the legislature has provided us some excellent funding. Whereas there's been some years it's been much tougher than we are in right now. But I, I do think it's important for the public to understand that and, and parents that choose that, that parent empowerment funding and to go and do that, that is their choice. I respect that. But the way it flows through our budget is sometimes a little misleading because it seems to look like we're getting six million. Yes. And in reality, we're actually getting a bill for one point something million. Correct, they're, yes, they're reducing us. They're reducing our things. So hopefully on a good note though, yes. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so thank you, um, Ms. Uh, Tammy, for, for doing that. The, uh, one, some, uh, one of the, the categoricals that's near and dear to me is the Florida School Recognition Funds, predominantly because a portion of that, we hope at the end of the day, works its way through to our school advisory councils. Um, but your report says <laughs> that from the these second calculations, it says there is no funds um, appropriated for the school recognition funds and the discretionary, district discretionary lottery funds. So uh, I know you, we talked today about this and I shared with you, and I'm sharing with the board, that I've spoken with some of our legislative contacts at Florida School Board Association for those of you who may remember, the governor and the legislature and the governor um, agreed and signed for $200 million to be added this year to the budget. And it's supposed to come through uh, the school recognition funds. There's 3 million students approximately in Florida, so $200 million is a lot of money when you think about a per pupil allocation. That appears to be that, that Florida School Board Association's context indicated that um, that DOE is saying that it should be coming soon. So it's not in the second calculation, which you have to use, which is yes, why sir. we have that sad note that you put there. Yes. But I'm hoping that becomes a, a bit of a happy note for us that we'll be getting a portion of that, uh, that monies. So I, I think there's a positive. And I just want to lastly say, well, I know I wanted to break down some of these numbers for, for those of us to remember uh, when we're talking with the public and for the public to understand. I, I, I really appreciate Representative Mazzullo, Senator Simpson, the legislature, and even our governor for the work that they've done because we do have a budget that we can work with and that we can meet a lot of needs for our students, for our staff, and for our families. So, while uh, we're always hoping for additional options, I'm still grateful to them, and uh, thank you for answering my questions. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question in reference to the budget on the uh, fund balance. Okay. Because we've obviously taken a hit there. Yes. Well, no, we've. it wasn't until last year we took the first hit, but it's been going up pretty On our pretty, steady. this sheet, is that what you want No, I'm looking at the budget, actually, the budget book. Okay. That is, yeah, that's in the budget. Yeah, and it, it's probably in that sheet too. Though. Okay. So can you just review that with us too? We're still meeting our three percent. Right, we're at three point five percent. So um, our original budget last year we were going to be at three point five. We did end up about six point three eight is what it came out to. And it is mostly due to being able to relieve some of the um, expenses with the ESR funding. Um, but as we had to increase salaries this year, that was a big hit. Um, you know, we were on a plan to move, you know, a dollar a year, move gradually into that, and then we had to meet this um, funding. So we, um, you know, we worked it, and we were able to give everybody a pretty decent raise on top of, you know, the people who were already at 15. So um, electricity is going up, gasoline is going up, lots of things are going up. Um, you know, there's an article in the paper the other day about electric going up around here. So um, all those things had to be taken into consideration with our um, general fund, because all those are paid for with general fund. At this point, the budget, we're going to be um, using about 5.7 million out of the budget, out of the fund balance this year. If you know, if every expense hits that we have budgeted. So um, we will have to, you know, next year see where we're at. And then we can't keep digging into our fund balance because eventually it'll be gone. Well, we so. we hit, what, six million? We took out of the fund balance this year? Um, for the budget, we were estimated to take six. We actually were able to put one million back into our fund balance this year with the help of the ESSER. I'm talking about what you're showing on the, the on the the budget. Oh, that's, that's the 22, the 23. That's yes, the budget. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we were able to put about a million back okay. in. So, which is still less than the previous year. We were able to put about 1.8 million in. So, we're so here. Um, the budget amount is a six million dollar reduction of our correct. Fund balance. Correct. Okay. 
and that's not even including the family empowerment funds that we have to budget the revenue. And what did we budget last year? We still budget. We budgeted a loss last year, didn't we? Yes, we did. How much was that? Do you remember? Um, well, for 2022, it's right here on the sheet. We actually budgeted almost a $10 million loss this we, last we, year, but then all the ESSER money started coming in, and we were able to, you know, pay the bonuses. Right. So out that's of that. going to be my question. I mean, with the money we're getting from ESSER, we should still be able to recoup some of that, right? And for our fund balance. Um, well, at this point, we've budgeted out. We've submitted the budgets. If there, you know, there seems to be some more monies coming in, but they want us to spend it on things above and beyond our normal everyday function. You know, they're not giving us ESSER money for electricity. They're not giving us ESSER money for gasoline or to transport students. So um, it's still supposed to be for those funds that are above and beyond. You know, like creating the e-school, that's something we were able to do with the ESSER funds. You know, we were able to buy, um, we needed new staff computers, those those dinosaurs we had were about 10 years old, I think, now. And, um, you know, bed cues for the classrooms we were able to do. And um, a lot of things with technology, we were able to go back and pay we refund the capital fund for the Apple lease payments that we had paid because those were putting devices in the students' hands that they used in case of a pandemic. It, they used them in the pandemic, and then, you know, if we, something happened again, we would be able to use them. So we were able to do things like that that helped us out. Right, and I guess I, what I'm trying to say is that it may not be as bad as we, we take it, right? If we, if we hope not. I mean, <laughs> last year we, we budgeted 10 million hit yeah. to the fund balance, we made a million, right? So this year we're budgeting basically six million, right. six million to the fund balance, and we still may increase it, possibly, Correct. right? With yes for money that we have. Um, uh, it's possible, you know, the salaries now, people are, um, you know, keeping their jobs, and, you know, we've raised the minimum wage, so that's that was a big hit. That was almost more than the teacher salary for us, so. Um, and that was we, supposed to be funded through the BSA. Right, and we have to maintain that. That's the big thing. That's maintaining, yeah. is maintaining that high pay. But the like yeah. you said, though, the, the ESSER funds largely it seemed like went to either new program creation, mm -hmm. which didn't really meant that it didn't hurt our budget, but it didn't help our budget, right. and then capital expenditures, which didn't help our general budget, but it definitely had a positive impact to our capital so that we could get some buses later or those right. air conditioning or some of those yes. other things that we had delayed on. Correct, mm -hmm. yes. And, or, or that they just plain rose cost on during that time. So yes. it, it would have been nice to have for it to have more positively impacted it, but I, I know it didn't. Like I, was, I was really honestly hoping it was gonna help more because I mean, we combed through I mean, until last week, we were combing through every expense that we spent in the general fund last year, seeing what was ESSERA eligible to move, you know, capital and general. And the capital definitely um, saw an increase. You'll see that when you get the work plan. But, um, you know, the general fund, at least we didn't, we were able to put a little bit back in. So we're still not at the fund balance we were when I started 16 years ago, though. I know that things have really changed a lot. Yeah. I'd love to have that fund balance, but obviously yes. we plan The capital and the general one yeah. would be yeah. nice to have. Yeah. So. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. I appreciate it. Thank have a you. good evening. Thank you. Okay, we need to approve the minutes. Thomas, you want to combine those? Move approval of the minutes of July 26, 2022 special meeting workshop and public hearing and the minutes from the August 9th, 2022 administrative hearing and regular meeting. Second. Do we have a um, second? Yeah, second. A second. Yeah, okay, excuse me. All those in favor. All those in favor. Aye. 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 <laughs> you guys knew what I was doing here. You forgive me. Okay. <laughs> Comment? Do we need to do ours and then sit some comments? No, yet citizen comments. No, citizen comments. comments. I see none. All have been very patient out there. Yes. Uh, Ms. Powers, do you have any comments? Yes, I do. <clears throat> uh, 
I mentioned to y'all about the legislative platform for uh, 2023, and I was under the assumption we had to get it together this week. Thomas reminded me, no. <laughs> we take individually send in what we want to propose, and then a while later, then we get all the things together and then present it to FSBA. So I just copied off the internet, the information that's on the internet about it. And if y'all will check it out at the by this Friday, I believe, mm -hmm. you have to have your suggestions in. So anything mm -hmm. you want to have F FSBA present, have it by this Friday. And then later on, we get together and have a memorial, I think, this by this Friday. Ms. Counts, do you have anything? No, we're doing SAC meetings this week in person, face to face, according yeah. to the new rules. And it was nice to be on in Harbor. I got three or four more to go. And we'll try and come up with at least two or three calendars for you on Thursday. Um, okay. But it's getting tougher and tougher with all the restrictions. So. Very good. Um, and last year it was, it, there were two, and we do it kind of in secret. It's almost like a CIA group. Come, go on, the, and we whisper to one another, but two calendars came out last year and they were almost identical, and that's why you only had two to choose from. We'd like to give you three, but um, the parameters are so tight. And just so anyone doesn't misunderstand, when you say in secret, you're talking about each of the groups each of our works. Groups. <laughs> there's, 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 I don't want somebody to think we're not working in the sunshine. Groups and we're supposed to come up with our calendar, and we, we stay very quiet about what we're doing in our group because we don't want them to know what we're doing. Um, and then we submit the calendar, unbeknownst to what the other two groups are doing, to, to Amy Crowell's office for accountability, and then she presents it to us. So. And you're the only board member on that committee, so it's not yes. like we're all sitting around <laughs> talking about. Yes, you <laughs> yes. represent as well. Thank you, yes. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Are you done? I, I've got a couple real things. Okay. Uh, first of all, SAC training. Um, I appreciate Miss Kaler and the educational okay. services team, Dr. Heber, um, put together an amazing um, school advisory council training for administrators and chairmen. Ms. Counts, thank you for attending, yeah. um, and I was there. Good. We had a, a several parents there at the first meeting, not as many at the second meeting, but I know we're working on that, and I'm really uh, proud, and the information was exceptional. Can I, as long as we're going yeah. public and people do see this, they, they watch us, um, the new thing is that it's going to shock some of our, especially our, our parents and community members on SAC, is they can't miss two meetings anymore. Um, or they're out. So that's one of the new SAC rules. And so I, if, if you volunteer for the SAC committee, please make sure that you are attending those meetings. Um, and the only thing we couldn't answer was, what if it's an excused absence, but we can't do anything telephonically or by Zoom anymore? We have to be face to face. Huh. I think that's in the statute. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. Means, yeah. And it's out. But they said two are out. Now, that's going to be a because we've got some community members that are really very, very involved, but I know every once in a while their business conflicts with a meeting. Mm -hmm. And that does. It's hard to get. Yeah. And I think, I did think it's the principal or the chair that has some di discretion on whether it's approved or unapproved. Or yeah, or, or like the last half meeting that I did, we didn't have a quorum, and so we didn't vote. You didn't, right. <laughs> we had a meeting, but we didn't vote. And our school advisory councils, again, are one of our most in, yeah. uh, informative and influential places for parents to have a direct collaborative um, impact on their child's school. And the other thing I wanted to just share with you all, um, I just came back uh, last week, I was at the Consortium of State School Board Associations inaugural um, Urban Boards Alliance Symposium. Now, what that really is, is we replaced um, the Board of Directors of Florida School Board Association we left the National School Board Association. We formed a more balanced uh, association. And what I really wanted to share, because the most exciting thing for me was at the end of it, I was sitting with a couple of school board members at a table from a total another state that uh, one might say from a more progressive state. And what the school board members said is they were so grateful that this organization and that these meetings was about why, how they were, could help kids mm -hmm. and not about political yes. affiliations yes. and beliefs. 
And I thought, well, that was the whole point. Ms. Pa I'm Ms. Uh, Bryant, you very instrumental on the board of directors of the Florida School Board Association with that decision. And uh, so I'll be reporting more on it in some of our meetings, but uh, it was a great symposium. And I, I thank this board for your support and help in being able to serve the state of Florida. Thank you. And that's it. Um, so I was um, pleased to hear the superintendent talk about 9-11 and the memorial and the oh, yeah. things that we do in the community. I just saw Ms. Powers down at the um, Valerie Theater. I was there too uh, for uh, the display that Narleo and some of the uh, Port Authority Police Department uh, officers put on every year and it was on a Sunday, 9-11 was a Sunday, so we weren't able to get students down there this year and, it, and that wasn't um, that really wasn't on us. That was because they didn't have it planned where they can do that. Uh, and I talked to Andy Tarpey, and you know, and, and we've been there many years in the past. Um, and um, you know, I know that Mr. Bittner has also uh, been in some discussions with him about how we can continue that process. It's interesting to hear the discussions now about a curriculum dealing with with uh, September 11th and the attack on our country. Uh, male Muslim extremists attacked our nation, and almost 3,000 people were killed and so we don't want to forget that and I think you know, we have done a, a pretty decent job in our county with keeping that out there to educate these kids these students were even born you know our students were even born yep. at, uh, in 2001 so um, you know I would be interested in us continue to look at that and and Mr. Kenny and, and Miss Powers I mean as legislative thing maybe that should be something FSBA should look towards is uh, a state of Florida curriculum uh, based on 9-11. Uh, on There's still time, Mr. Dodd, till for Friday. You can write it up in <laughs> a very quick form. Continue that. We would yeah. love to see that. Okay. 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 I will add the court. <laughs> have to pay for it in the meetings. Um, also, Red Ribbon Week is coming up uh, in October, um, so we're going to have another meeting before then, but um, I, I'm hoping that we're still involved with that. Uh, Dr. Eber, if I guess I see you nodding your head that we're still involved with uh, with that program. Um, and then I would like to bring to the board who we play for um, the EKG screening is going to be back in Citrus County October 4th and 5th. Um, and they're actually looking for volunteers uh, to do the screenings. Now, I volunteered uh, to go to Citrus High School on October 4th. Uh, it's 5 to 7. Uh, I didn't know if you guys would want to make, make an appearance or come to volunteer. But they are uh, the Royal Legacy is looking for uh, for volunteers, so we're trying to help out with that program and EKG screenings. Help me in. Okay, Crystal River, Crystal River, and Lacanto are on October fifth. Yep. Uh, five to seven. Um, well, that's why you I couldn't. It's because I've got the. FSBA well, board of directors here. Because I, okay. I was trying to think, okay. there was a reason I planned on going. Okay, so October 4th is Citrus High 5 to 7, October 5th is Crystal River and Lacanto. Um, so I don't know. I understand the Health Academy is coming out. The Health Academy is help. supposed to be coming out, but yeah. uh, hopefully at all three of the That's what I understood. <laughs> yeah, we, we've, we've put that out there to them, so that I think that could very well be the case, which is what we talked about on this board with you know tying all that in so uh, you know that's voluntary uh, yes, yes, it is. yes yeah and you know this is a voluntary um, opportunity for twenty dollars for someone to come uh, have their student athlete um, screened with an EKG for heart issues heart conditions and uh, you know I would like to see this thing grow here in our county and um, we did it back when they had the physicals this summer and uh, you know, there was a fairly decent number of kids that came through, but it should be more. So I think that uh, this time is just going to be for EKGs or ECGs, whatever you want to electrocardiograms. So it will be interesting to see um, how the turnout is, but I'm glad that we are supporting. We should say that it's not just held for athletes, it's for any of the kids, right? I think it's, it's for middle there, school. If there's potential so, athletes or something, uh, I, yeah, they, yeah, they have I to don't, be a current athlete. No, if they're going to try out for a team, they can come. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So I don't know, and I know Mr. Bishop's not here. I think it's for student athletes or those trying out for teams. Uh, but I know the district has been advertising it, yeah. so I'm sure it's on that on that district uh, mm -hmm. that advertisement. So Miss Lindy has done a Lindsay has done a major job, and uh, she always does. Even we even found a little link that wasn't her fault that who we play for we uh, so we we got some people contacting their they are 
they're signing up for this. Yes, it, so, you've got to go online to sign up, but um, the Rural Legacy is going to provide for uh, money for those students who can't afford the $20. Um, it's not tied into physicals this time, it's only EKGs, so uh, hopefully you know, we get the word out there and, and it only takes a couple students or a couple parents to say, hey, this is important, you know, go sign up and have this screening done. And I had my son screened at Citrus High this, this summer uh, and I was impressed with the whole process. So. Actually, Mr. Uh, Bishop is saying it is for any student. So okay. it doesn't sound like there'll be a student. Okay, any student can come for um, EKG. He is, I'm not sure. <laughs> <just screen. laughs> <laughs> uh, the walls have ears. And I'm just saying volunteers do. They're not doing anything. Okay, different. so there's some check-in things, and I, and we're going to try to use the um, the students and, and their personnel to actually apply the, um, the contacts. But there's, um, I think they only need like six to eight volunteers at each school, so a lot of it's... Uh, there will be plus, like some clerical things, so um, you won't have to um, you won't have to place those. Um, and the, the students are actually uh, what's kind of cool is you've got an EKG program at Christ River High School Health Academy and the CNAs and the EMTs. They're learning a lot of this, so it's it was such a great way of getting everybody together. It is. It's October the fourth. October fourth is at Citrus High School, five to seven, and October fifth. Is at Christ River High School and Lacanto High School from five to seven, are the are the two days that they're going to be here. Um, and then um, I was pleased. I know we approved uh, two schools to go to the Sun Belt Ag, Ag Expo mm -hmm. in Moultrie, Georgia, and I talked to Mr. Uh, Mullen, and hopefully Citrus Citrus High School hopefully mm -hmm. will be able to send some kids too. They're working on that. They're without an ag teacher, but I think they're close to hiring a new one. But FFA, you know, we all support. Uh, the FFA program, and so uh, um, you know, we approved that. Hopefully, we'll be approving um, something for Citrus High School, and they can all go on the same bus. They charter a bus, and I understand it's a really neat expo. I, I, have, I m one day may like to go to that, but um, I think that I'm glad that we're working that way. And then um, I will tell you the other thing I will recommend. And Mr. Kenny, I know you've talked. You're passionate about uh, the SAC committees, and. Uh, um, so I had made the recommendation at, on Marty Stone Douglas Commission that we um, uh, move to require um, school safety to be a discussion item at all the SAC meetings, right. which it could be easily added to the yeah. statute. Yeah. I think that would be a great tool, a great thing for FSBA. We're meeting again um, coming up in a couple months with MSD, and they're, we're going to put these things together for legislative session. You really, I mean, seriously, if you have a minute and just can put it into that yeah, over because I think that's a great that's idea. I mean, that one is just, yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah. because it, because it and, and Mr. Dodd, it's not just that it could make on the platform, but if it can also make to our lobbying team, yeah. that's right. really one that's a win for everyone. It is. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that it just excites me just hearing. Mm -hmm. and, and we've got a couple of years of student <clears throat> surveys that on that one question, where do you feel safest at yeah. your school? The, the answer has consistently been in your classrooms. Well, and I, you know, I think that the law, and Mr. Kenny probably knows, I think it only requires a quarterly meeting, doesn't it, for SAC? Isn't that the requirement for the school advisor? Yeah, meeting? it's we, only a quarterly. We have more than that. Times a year we do, and I'm it's very positive. Really, the only reason that it went to quarterly is because we didn't have as much money to talk right. about. Right. But now, as we may be having more money coming in, right. there could be more reasons to start having conversations mm -hmm. so that that money can be get used by those students. And then the last thing I had uh, on the housekeeping <clears throat> was our um, September workshop. I know we have a, a one o'clock due process hearing. Right. I assume that's still on. That's right. But I, I, just for calendar's sake, I didn't know what we were talking about for a meeting that day. <laughs> We're having a meeting, right? Yes. Yeah. Do it at nine o'clock in the morning. Nine a.m. Okay. Nine o'clock, with a, a due process hearing at one. One. So we'll break for lunch. Or <laughs> will we have Mr. Uh, can we have this some so square <laughs> some square pizzas? <laughs> I don't anticipate that hearing lasting terribly long. So we we'll can eat afterwards. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, we can eat afterwards tonight. Yeah. Uh, no, I'd probably eat before. Yeah, Mr. Dodd likes to eat about noon. No, that's, that's exactly right. I think it'd be a couple hours just because things take longer than we think. 
Well, I think it would be cool for Mr. Pistoni. I mean, we've paid for this before. Is that we I have no problem paying, paying for square pizza, especially I mean, for square hey, pizza. They could come and <laughs> with her, you know, so. some of the things are serving and bring, bring, bring something. So who's going to call Mr. Pistoni? Would you like me to do that? I'll do that tomorrow. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and you know, we can pay for it. We'll just stay here for lunch. Okay. Very good. Okay. All right. No one has anything else? We're adjourned. No, I, no, I just want to, when you talk about the physical components of dealing with the children, I want to also put the mental health components in there. So they go hand in hand. Yes, yes ma'am.